I say, if, if you was asked nine out of ten blokes in the street in in the uh, UK what they what you thought of the uh, of the Borneo situation and everything, got up at the nine out of ten of them wouldn't wouldn't even come up with an answer about it. The uh, newspapers slant the news, obviously they always have done, and they've got this kind of mixed up picture of um, bare-breasted maidens around every tree, uh, giving you the old love signs and things. You think when you're black in a place like UK that jungle is jungle and you can walk just the same as you can walk down the high street. That's impossible, absolutely. I mean, uh, the, the, the town centre near where I live is approximately a mile and I can walk it in a quarter of an hour. Whereas, I mean, here, you can't get more than, what, 250 yards, 200 yards. And that's the big shattering blow that comes. You just can't walk through the jungle like you can walk down the high street. Somewhere down there, a jungle patrol has signalled to base that it's almost out of food. The balloon, released by the men below, gives their exact position to the helicopter, which has flown out to resupply them. Food for 12 men for another four days. The patrol has made its way to that position in order to build a small fort out of which they and others can make further patrols along the Indonesian border. By the time they've finished that food, they'll have cut a clearing big enough to land a helicopter. Meanwhile, the helicopter goes on to complete its mission, the resupply of an existing fort. couldn't work without helicopter pilots as it is. You get a sort of confidence by knowing that they're always there and they're, they're willing to help us and they won't say, oh, regulation so-and-so says, I can't do it. They come in and they're told, you know, bad weather says, um, technically you can't take any mail into that location because this weather's bad. But they come in hugging the deck right underneath the weather, zooms round, squishes to a halt and lands about a 10-foot pad, drops a mail, smiles and nips off again. They'll do everything they can to help you. There's no doubt about it. The majority of them do that. The majority of them are, uh, are really sterling blokes and chaps who I'd buy six pints a night if I met in the pub and It's a pleasure to know them. The men in this fort are Royal Marines. They're 40 or 50 miles from the nearest road or track and are entirely dependent on the helicopters for food, ammunition, clothing, mail, even fresh eggs. John Knox. Marine Giles. There's an old post office thing saying someone somewhere wants a letter from you. Well, some of the lads out here say it'll be here for two years, say, and they get a letter once every three months. It means a lot. Marine, I think I've, I hold the record at the moment because I've been writing to this girl, writing to her for 17 months. I was due to go home in three weeks' time, and I got a dear John. In other words, well, I'm sorry that's your lot, mate. I've gone off with somebody else. Courage. It means hell of a lot to get a letter from someone. You can sit down and practically read it off by heart. And it, you can't really say what it means unless you've actually done it yourself. Oh. You're not going down again, 6-1. <laughs> Spurs are well down, aren't they, this year? Chelsea at the moment. 17 points, they're 3 points clear. Chelsea lost. Oh, they've got one in the rugby for change. Oh, they do for change in the rugby. Bloody hell. 
Beside the soldiers who live here, there are two Ibans, local Borneo people, renowned for their skill in the jungle as trackers. Boy, Iban. 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 What Iban? Buddha, Dodo. Buddha, Ladu, Dodo. Buddha. Jalai. 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 Jalai Mtuka. Jalai Tumka. Mtuka. Yeah. Road. Yeah. Scotland, that. Yeah. Tiger. You know? No, I don't. You're better by Tiger. Up there, Scotland. This fort, about the size of a tennis court, is the home of 25 men. Each man builds his own rough bivouac, or grot, as they call them. The building materials are ground sheets, logs, old ration boxes and string. A good one is rainproof, and it rains almost every night. Apart from the twice-weekly helicopter, the only contact with the rest of the world is through the signaller. The commonest complaint, foot rot, caused by wearing wet jungle boots on patrol for days on end. This fort, and others like it, is very close to the Indonesian border. If the Indonesians do attack, it will be in some strength. Day and night, sentries are watching watching the surrounding jungle for an attack. It may never come, but if it does, it could be with less than 10 seconds warning. Most of the men here are either resting after their last patrol or preparing for their next one. The fort is their base. The task of these patrols is always the same, to seek out the IBT, the Indonesian border terrorist. The patrol, usually 12 men, leaves its hilltop base. It may be away for two days or two weeks. British troops have been fighting in the jungles of Southeast Asia for 15 years. First in Malaya, now in the so-called Indonesian confrontation. Indonesia's object is to overthrow the newly independent nation of Malaysia. She's using the classic methods of border infiltration and then subversion beyond. Indonesia has the third largest communist party in the world. Once British troops are committed, their support involves a good deal more than the odd helicopter dropping rations. Britain has had to honour her treaty with Malaysia with most of the sophisticated and expensive machinery of modern warfare. Indonesia has a fleet of Russian-built ships and squadrons of American and British-built aircraft. She hasn't used them yet, but the fact that she has them means we must have jets and anti-aircraft guns, helicopters and artillery, armoured cars and radar.
Our lines of supply and communication are 8,000 miles long. They end here in Borneo. They begin on the other side of the world. The Australians too have come north to watch the coast and the intentions of Indonesia. We are committed to fighting a purely defensive campaign. To the frustration of many of the troops, we operate only on our side of the border. Much of the initiative must therefore be with the Indonesians. This film was made at the northern end of a border which stretches for a thousand jungle miles. This region of swamp, jungle and rivers is manned by men of 40 commando, Royal Marines, and 79 battery, Royal Artillery. Every five or six weeks, the particular company manning the forward border positions is relieved by another company. In making himself comfortable, the British soldier has a reputation as a scrounger second to none. But in the jungle, there isn't much to scrounge, so he has to make do with what he's got. Yeah. Well, we'll leave these for the fast touches on, Sam. <laughs> The dog is not a pet. He's used on patrols as a tracker. Stop bleeding quick, Sean. Okay, young stop the old um, first field. In this particular fort, some of the men have gone down with an unexplained fever. Temperatures go up to 104. Well, nobody actually knows what causes this fever. This is the reason for taking this blood. Uh, the only thing we can do is send samples for testing. Uh, if we can find out what causes the fever, then of course you can, you can find an answer, the treatment for it. The first maxim of any anti-terrorist campaign is to win and hold the friendship of the local people. Out here, that usually means losing to them at football. <laughs> if you get the kids on your side, you, you definitely achieve something, because if you've got them with you, um, they get used to you, and once they know that you, they've no need to be frightened of you, I think you've achieved something. If you can make, sort of win them over and let them realise that you're here to help them and not frighten them, I think that uh, they get used to you and that they're a lot of fun, really. They definitely know whose side they're on and whose side they don't want to be on. Really, it's a battle in itself with the civilians, I think. I, I think it's a battle in itself. And as far as the Indonesians are concerned, well, I mean, I, I don't honestly know how they feel about it, but they, they seem to show to us that they'd much prefer to have us here than they would the Indonesians. <coughs> 20 miles forward of the medicine and football, the other side of the war is a silent business of watching, watching the Indonesian bank of a river from a secret observation post. Somewhere on the other side are rumoured to be at least 500 well-armed troops. Well, they're building up to something. I think that's what it looks like. It's been so quiet for the last couple of months. And there's definitely something going on with shots in the night, trees being chopped down, etc. One can watch the enemy across a river, but the only way one can find him, if he secretly crosses a jungle border, is to go and look for him. To patrol. No one can move through the jungle without leaving tracks. It's the particular job of the patrol's two leading scouts to search for these tracks. But obviously the unarmed cameraman was not allowed to travel with them at the head of the patrol. The patrol moves slowly, each man keeping at least ten yards behind the man in front. 
the greatest and constant danger is ambush. The Indonesians know that patrols are looking for them. They could be lying in wait. All the time I'm thinking about if we get ambushed, what will we do? Will we go left? Will we go right? That's a good ambush position up there. I'll have to watch that as I'm going along. And my mind's ticking over all the time exactly what we would do. If we were attacked, it's exactly what we would do. What? On a three-day patrol, uh, it really... Uh, my mind's never still, really. This business of tension on patrolling builds up because of the closeness and the, the denseness of the jungle, which you feel is all round you. Visibility is very seldom more than about 10 or 20 yards in the jungle. And the very thought that there may be a chap hiding around the corner, round any tree, round any piece of undergrowth, or 10 chaps, or 20 chaps, or 30 chaps, who can pour down lead at a terrific rate into you at no warning at all. It contributes a lot to the wearying of patrols. I'm sure you get very tired through this constant feeling of the closeness all the time. The trouble is that many places around here you can hide. I mean, you can hide anywhere around here. You could go past them and never see them and notice them. You know. Every hour or so, the patrol leader signals a ten-minute break. In the course of an hour, the patrol can travel, if the going is not too bad, maybe half a mile. And a man can lose a pint of sweat. Sentries are always on guard. This is the time for getting rid of leeches. A cigarette is best. One should never try to pull a leech off for its head will break away and stay embedded in the skin, and it will inevitably fester. A leech secretes a fluid which prevents blood from clotting, so the sore goes on oozing for hours. three-day patrol, you've got three of those small 24-hour ration packs. Not much weight in them, but after you can carry them quite a while, they seem to get heavier. So we always travel as light as possible. All you really need is your, your food, your dry clothing for a night, and your ground sheet to either cover over you or put on the deck to keep the wet out then. I mean, you don't need any excess gear. You can take a tin of foot pad, something like that, you know. But they're all more or less luxuries. Water, two, well, I always carry two for walk bottles, whether it's a short patrol or a long patrol. You never know when you're going to get caught out. The jungle boot will last, if you're lucky, two days or three days on patrol. It doesn't drain, and this keeps your feet wet. You're walking in a a puddle of water the whole time, your feet go rotten. It seems such a basic element of kit for going into the jungle. But we've been operating in the jungle for many, many years now, and one would have thought that a decent jungle boot would have come out of all this. By the end of the day, the patrol has moved at the most five miles. The map shows that there is water in the area, but maps of these parts don't have too much relation to fact. The patrol will have to make do with what is left in its water bottles, for by now it's four o'clock and a camp must be made. This allows two hours for everyone to cook a meal and put up a vivi. It will be dark by six, and the night lasts 12 hours.
there are always sentries. The patrol corporal arranges everyone for their watches during the night. Everyone will be up at least twice, for one and a half hours at a time. In the dusk, the jungle crickets, thousands of them, are almost deafening. The signaller gets his aerial as high as possible. Mike Victor, 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 one, this is one, one, off, brother. The cookers run on tablets of solid fuel. The meal is usually a composite one course affair of rice, stew, raisins, peas, jam and tea. The tea November, is served separately. I'm proceeding to Point Charlie. I'm proceeding to See, Point we generally carry a spare set of dry clothing and dry socks, so at night we can strip the wet stuff off and just hang it up where we like. Build your bivy as waterproof as possible and off the ground if possible, because it rain you're going to get wet if you're on the deck anyway. And uh, put your dry stuff on to sleep on, and in the morning, first thing, you just put your wet stuff back on again. That's the most sort of uncomfortable part of that, I think, putting the wet stuff on in the morning. Dusk has always been a time for sneak attacks. The enemy can withdraw under cover of darkness. On every patrol, and at all the forts along the border, Everyone stands guard with loaded weapons. For the next 12 hours, there'll be no lights and no talking. Just sleep and guards. I think the real danger lies at night. The Indonesians don't like attacking by day. Um, even at night time, when they do attack, they nearly always attack between 10 o'clock at night and, say, 2 o'clock in the morning. They never really attack when they're an awful long way from the border, because as soon as they attack at night, they like to get away. They usually attack on a moonlit night as well. They attack, they come in, fire a quick burst of shot. And uh, they then open their quick engagement, uh, usually beaten off, and the back over the border they go as quickly as their little legs will carry them. That is really the, what, in my own mind, the, really the real danger of it. Somebody creeping up on you at night. I certainly wouldn't like it. I certainly wouldn't like it. As soon as there is any light at all, the patrol packs up and moves off to find water. In the gloom of a small valley, they find their water. The leader signals for the machine gunner to take guard while the patrol fills its water bottles and cooks a meal. First, the water must be filtered through a canvas bag. Then, two sterilizing tablets must be put into each water bottle. Half an hour must be allowed for the chemical to take effect. Then, another kind of pill must be put in to kill the taste of the first two. Then, one can drink the water. As soon as the morning mist has lifted out of the jungle, 
the helicopters are on their way to resupply the forts. This is that clearing into which food was dropped four days ago. The men have now cut a bigger clearing. Here they're establishing another fort out of which they'll patrol along a part of the border previously uncovered. Besides wire, nails, saws, ammunition and food, the helicopter has brought in an officer to discuss the future plans for this new patrol base. He has ten minutes before the helicopter flies back to talk to the patrol leader. This river is the most, this Sulak is the most extraordinary river. It's hidden completely. I was 20 yards away from it the other day and I never saw it. And we are exactly there. So we're right on Donut. Yeah, we're right yeah. on Donut now, sir. Good. Is there any sign of movement at all along this track? No, there isn't. Um, there, the other night, at about half past two in the morning, um, there were a succession of shots. It was um, not the night before last, half past two. A succession of shots. Um, this was Sunday night. Yeah. Yes. From uh, it was from the west. In, yeah. In fact, we were then. Um, just here. It was here, somewhere between Sula. Yeah. Now I think this was, it wasn't any of our people. No. I think, I'm pretty sure it was um, a hunting party. Hunting. Yeah. The British soldier sometimes complains about his job, but then he always has. And anyway, when pressed, he'll agree that he's doing what he's paid and trained to do. It's just that he doesn't care to be taken completely for granted. There is one or two people in the UK that know the actual political situation, but there's not many other than relatives of the actual people that's out here that know exactly what it, the British forces are doing out here. At least I don't think there is any. I don't think anybody now in their right minds in this day and age wants a war. I think the present situation is stalemate with possibly the initiative on the Indonesian side because politically we can't come to grips with them until they come over here to meet us. Uh, that is, I think, is the only bad thing about it. But at the same time, it's a happier situation at the moment than it would be if the whole thing was to burst out and we, we start a war and then it would become involved. We're here to prevent the Indonesians from taking over a part of the country which, uh, which uh, doesn't wish to become part of Indonesia. It's the fact that the job happens to be uh, boring, tedious, and we'd perhaps rather be with our families in Singapore is immaterial. We're soldiers doing a job, and this is the job for which we're trained.